Um, so yeah, our first speaker today will be Grayson Murphy, who's digital preservation librarian at the University of Alabama, Birmingham in the United States, because I'm from Birmingham in the UK. So I, I have to clarify this and avoid any confusion. Grayson is going to be sharing two workflows with us today. The first one is entitled um, Full Lifecycle Workflow of Digitized Documents and Books. And then he'll go on to a second one about preserving legacy digital collections. Um, we'll pause, as Sarah says, for questions after each workflow, and then we'll move on to a final presentation by Brent, Brent West, who's Associate Director for Information Governments and Strategic Initiatives at the University of Illinois, also in the US. And he'll share his workflow for AI-based email preservation. Just to re-emphasize what Sarah said there, each speaker will have about 20 minutes to present their workflow, and then we'll have about five minutes available for questions and answers and discussions before moving on to the, the next presentation. Uh, Grayson's mentioned that he has to go at the top of the hour, so after his second presentation. So make sure, if, you know, if you've got a question for him and it's a burning one, you know, get it in the chat, get it out um, before Grayson has to leave. But uh, without further ado, Grayson, if you're ready to tell us about your workflow for digitized documents, please just take it away. Awesome. Obligatory, uh, can you hear me? All right, so I'll share screen. All right, so thank you to Michael, Ellie, and Sarah um, for putting this on and the DPC in general. Um, so I am the Digital Preservation Librarian at University of Alabama at Birmingham, and um, like I said, I'll be going over two workflows. The first workflow is actually our like generic, um, you know, everyday digital, digitization lab workflow. And, and then the second workflow is a workflow for a project that I have been working on over the past few months, getting some of our legacy materials into preservation. So before we start, I wanted to sort of orient you as to where we are. Um, so I'm at University of Alabama at Birmingham. So um, we are in the Southeastern United States, as you can see on the map. And we are a young university. We're a public institution and we were established about 50 years ago. But since then we've gone, grown into a research one um, R1 university and we have over 22,000 students. And so we've, we've grown quite a bit in that time. And we also have one of the largest medical academic medical centers in the United States. So we are small, but growing. And I also wanna orient you to the work that I do and the department that I do within UAB libraries. So we are called the digitization and digital preservation department. We lovingly refer to ourselves as DND, &D, a little tongue in cheek there. And we are a new department. So we were only formed within the last three years. And we were previously a digital unit within cataloging and then UAB libraries sort of did some reorganization. And we are the first team to focus on digital preservation at UAB libraries. And so right now we have four full-time team members. There's the head of our department and he was hired about three years ago at the start of the department. There is our digital imaging manager and she has been at UAB libraries in various capacities for quite some time. And she uh, transitioned to this role at the start of our department. And then myself and the digital curation librarian who's we like to say is in charge of sort of the access side of things we joined about a year ago. So, um, and we also have uh, four currently part-time student workers who work in our digitization lab. So as to what we work on, we digitize and preserve various content. Um, we primarily work with our historical collections within UAB libraries. They have extensive uh, collections in both print and AV materials, but we've also started to branch out to other UAB entities, including university publications from across campus, and we also steward things like theses and dissertations from students and other faculty work. So now on to the actual workflow. I initially titled it, I think, digitized documents and books, but then the digital imaging manager said, why don't you just call it print? So that made more sense. So digitized print materials workflow. And um, a little bit about this workflow is, it was the first workflow that was created when the department um, was established. And so we have a digitization lab and um, this you know, was the workflow of getting things digitized and into preservation from things that um, primarily started from historical collections. 
And I also want to note that I was not here when the majority of this workflow was created, so I will be speaking um, sort of retroactively um, about it. And so table contents, I'm going to be talking first about the questions that sort of guided the workflow creation when things were getting going. Then I'm going to go through the actual workflow steps. And then I'm going to end with some sticking points and lessons learned. All right, so the first question that, um, and I also want to note these slides were adapted from a presentation that my supervisor, Luke Menzies, and I did a, a few months ago. Um, so the first question is the big one, you know, how do we implement OAS, the OAS reference model at UAB? That is sort of the foundation of, you know, where we started. And from that, it became clear that, you know, from a preservation standpoint, ingest is the most important process. So um, with that in mind, you sort of start to think, okay, well then if ingest is the most important process, then how do we build in safeguards and, and checkpoints with which to make sure that that process goes smoothly and we can ensure file integrity. And along those same lines, uh, we sort of decided that the APE or um, Archival Information Package was the building block. So how do we, what's our ideal APE look like? And then how do we work backwards from that? And in general, we wanted to make sure that uh, the process was well-documented, consistent, and standards compliant wherever possible. With that in mind, uh, we asked the question, how do we structure our apes? So this is a, um, an image of what our apes look like of things that are digitized in our lab. And so one of the biggest things we decided on to start was, do we package at the item level or at the collection level? And we ultimately decided to package at the item level, um, primarily because it allows us to get things into preservation as quickly as possible versus if you image everything that's going into collection, then you sort of have to wait for that last piece to be digitized. And so that content while not super high risk, is still at risk just sitting and waiting to be packaged. And the other thing that, or the other benefit of, of digitizing, or excuse me, packaging at the item level is that um, things are smaller, like the packages are smaller. So if something goes wrong and we need to fix a package, it's much easier to handle, um, you know, reprocessing something small versus one thing is wrong in a giant package of a giant collection, and then you have to reprocess that whole collection. And another um, another benefit is with the smaller packages is when you're transferring materials, there's just a little bit less risk transferring multiple small things rather than one giant thing. Because if something goes wrong, you know, 90% through the transfer of a large item, then you have to start all over again. So it keeps things manageable and you know lowers the risk of um, you know something going wrong. So let me get my laser pointer here. There we go. So uh, I'll walk through the um, our ape here. So at the lowest level, we have actually just you know the actual stuff we're concerned about is the payload, and um, it's for lab generated items. It's all of our tiffs. It's all of our master tiffs. So the unedited raw tiffs um, that we digitize straight to. And then we also have um, what we call our minimal metadata CSVs. And the first uh, one is the metadata CSV. And this contains six fields. They're not, um, you know, anything, they're, they're control vocabulary for us, but they're not, you know, a, um, a control vocabulary recognized broadly. But um, so the first is our system UUID. And I uh, just want to say we're aware this is not a UUID in the traditional computational sense, but this is how we colloquially refer to our unique identifiers. And it's just um, a way for us to both say who owns it and what the collection is and then a number. And then it, we have the local ID, which is typically a call number or an accession number, but that basically tells us where is the physical, where can we find the physical item with which this digital derivative was generated from. And then this is a code for who owns the physical item, the collection code. Then we also have item types. Um, this is not standard to any controlled vocabulary, but we do have a controlled vocabulary internal. And this basically is just what is this thing and who packaged it. So if something went wrong in the packaging, we can sort of trace back what went wrong. So the main purpose of this minimal metadata is to basically tell us what is this thing, who owns it, and um, you know how did it 
come to be. And so if uh, my boss likes to say, if a package is found floating in space and we can peek in at the CSV and sort of orient ourselves and figure out what it is. Um, so that's the purpose of that is just if something goes wrong, we can always look into it and see what it is versus having to identify it by the actual contents. And then we have a human readable tag manifest. Um, so that's MD5 and SHA-256 um, checksums for each individual file within the package. So again, just having that backup um, file integrity built in. The next level, we have our Bagot TXTX um, files with a site addition of our AP Trust. So we are a member of Academic Preservation Trust, Higher Education Digital Preservation Consortium um, within the United States. And so this file helps with the ingest and telling it where to go and stuff. And then at the very top, we have we tar everything and name it by the UUID. All right, so our next major question is how to minimize risk. I would sort of argue that that's sort of our main job as digital preservation practitioners is assessing risk and trying to minimize it as much as possible. And so the first risk is, um, you know, how to minimize data loss during processing. And by processing, we mean imaging, organizing, and packaging. So to minimize that risk, we process objects whenever possible on the same machine that they were created. So we're never going to image to a, you know, send the images to a, or scanned images to an external hard drive, then pull those images onto a local computer, then package those, and then move those elsewhere. We're always going to um, package on the same machine where the scanned images were initially saved and edited on. And so that eliminates um, some risk when you're transferring stuff. The other thing is that when we actually transfer materials, um, they are, uh, either tarred or zipped, and we run fixity checks on both sides to make sure nothing happened in that process um, between point A and point B. And then um, we also, as I sort of discussed with the minimal metadata, if something goes wrong with an actual processed ape, we have that minimal metadata embedded within it. And that means that we can always tell what it is if something goes wrong. Um, you know, uh, my boss has told a story before about an issue at a previous institution where went wrong with the indexing of Archivematica and it lost, I think the initial, like the ingest names didn't, it lost the match between the ingest names and the Archivematica ID. And so they, without this minimal metadata embedded, they just had all these apes that they couldn't identify other than looking, looking at the actual content and trying to piece it together. So that minimal metadata sort of um, saves that risk. And we also process in small batches. So in the lab, they scan a, usually less than 20, but depending on how big the items are, um, you know, five to 20 at once, and then they process and package in batches. And so that keeps things manageable and, and keeps the risk low versus processing 100 things at once. Um, and then we also have certain checkpoints that sort of keep whoever's digitizing um, in uh, that keeps them in, in check with, um, you know, making sure they're, they're touching every point that they need to and not, um, you know, just sort of rolling out of control and forgetting certain things. So we have a processing log to minimize that risk of sort of forgetting about a step. So our first step is obviously the actual imaging. Um, we have a lab of flatbed scanners and a digital transitions atom, which is pictured here. And we, um, we image image, or excuse me, we image rare and fragile materials on the DT Atom. Um, we have a collection of Incunabula, which are books um, published between 1450 and 1500. So those are obviously very rare and need to be handled with care. So those are imaged on the Atom and other stuff is imaged on flatbed scanners. So from the images, um, we generate master TIFF files and so those are unedited, haven't gone through post-processing, and those are actually what go into our preservation package. And then from those, derivative TIFFs are created. So those are cropped, go through, you know, color correction and whatnot, but those are not put into our packages. And then, like I said, they keep track of the imaging on the shared processing log. And this log, each collection has its own um, own log, and then each item within a collection has its own line. And then there are, there's accessioning and imaging preservation and a, what we call dip store. That's our storage for access master copies. Um, so th those sections are on the processing log. 
here's a quick look at our processing log. You can see each item has its own line and then it, you know, we can keep track of who's doing what, what the data is. Some of this information goes into our minimal metadata. Next is actually generating the SIPs. Um, so we use two Python scripts to do, to do this. Uh, the first is called DND Prepack, and it this basically generates the minimal metadata CSV. So the user, we, it has a GUI, and the user inputs that minimal metadata information, and it just peeks at a folder with all the items in it and generates a CSV with all those items. And then once that's generated, the user goes in and adds the local IDs and saves it. And that CSV is fed into the next script, which is obviously SIPMaker. And this does a number of things. Um, it pre-bags or organizes the objects in the structure we want it uh, to be bagged in. It creates those minimal, met minimal metadata files. It runs those um, checksums and bags it, tars it, and then runs what we call a transfer manifest, which does checksums on the actual completed tars themselves. So when we transfer the tars to a different location, we can run a transfer manifest after the transfer and compare the two. And so once they've generated the TARs, they upload them to a network attached server. We use Synology boxes and um, they make sure they run the transfer manifest on both sides again to, to assure the integrity. To date, we have not run into anything that has failed to check some um, check, which is good. So here's where I come in. Um, I Once the stuff is uploaded to our NAS, then I, um, I do some quality control before I ingest them into our various preservation storage locations. And that quality control utilizes 7-zip, um, which I just sort of peek into the tar. For each batch, I look at one or two. And what I'm looking for is making sure that the file structure and hierarchy is correct within the SIP. I'm also making sure that our AP Trust TXT file is correct because within that file, we identify where um, the location that we're sending it to. And so that I need to make sure that's correct, that we're not sending things to the wrong location with an AP Trust. And then I also make sure the minimal metadata CSV is populated correctly. Sometimes people forget to add the local ID. Um, so I just make sure everything looks right. And then once everything looks good, I then use a command line interface script to upload things to AP Trust. And that just utilizes, uh, they use AWS, so that utilizes AWS software development kit tools. And that also just, it takes, you know, our personal keys, the path of the items to upload, and then it just shoots them off. So let's talk about some sticking points. Um, one of the first things that uh, my boss and the digital imaging manager had to figure out was how do we ensure and build trust that we can maintain the safety of the physical items because we are not the stewards of the physical items. You know, people from historical collections are insuring us with them. So to do so, we, uh, we have a lab that is only accessible by scanning campus ID. So only certain people are able to get into it. So we'll never have people just randomly walking into our lab. We also have a, a dehumidifier running 24-7 um, to maintain um, climate control, which is also very important in the summer in Alabama. It gets very humid. And our student workers are trained in safe handling practices. So you, we sort of, whenever we're talking with new people, we, we talk about that as, as building that trust and saying, you know, your items are safe with us. The other sticking point was where to put the scanned images during imaging. So we have shared lab computers in the digitization lab. And um, initially it was thought that we, the students would scan the images to their, you know, a folder on their desktop in on their, you know, account. But the issue arose with that where our digital imaging manager could then not, if something went wrong or, or she needed to do any quality control, she couldn't go in because it was locked to the student's account. So uh, we decided to use external hard drives that are connected to the computers. And so they scan directly to the hard drive and they package directly on the hard drive. And that means that um, another student can finish another student's work and the digital imaging manager can come after them and do some quality control or fix things because it's not tied to an account. And it also means that the hard drives could be moved if need be. 
And the final sticking point was sort of the biggest one was whether or not to preserve the derivative TIFFs or the TIFFs that have gone through the post-processing of you know, cropping and color correction and whatnot. Um, initially, and for about the first six months of actually digitizing things, we did put those derivative TIFFs in the preservation package. And that was mostly just because we thought, you know, we might as well preserve that post-processing work. And, but the cons of that were that um, since they were only slightly edited, it effectively doubled the size of the preservation packages, which obviously has some ramifications for higher storage costs down the road, higher environmental impact. And so, um, and another con was that it, it sort of complicated the, the digital services lab workflows when they uh, needed to switch to generating the derivatives, it sort of complicated things. Um, so we ultimately decided that it wasn't worth, um, you know, keeping, it wasn't, it wasn't worth the sustainability risk of just ballooning our preservation packages. And um, so we decided about six months into packaging things to not, um, not preserve those derivatives. And so the solution was then to put the derivatives in, and what I mentioned earlier is our short-term, what we call dip store on our local NAS share. So those will sit there for, we haven't figured out the retention schedule because um, we have plenty of space on it, but those will sit there for a certain amount of time in case we need to fix things and go back to things, which we have a couple of times. So lessons learned, what's the point of a, a workflow if we don't learn? Uh, so most important lesson is to be realistic as to what people executing the workflow can and will do. I think a lot of times in digital preservation, we sort of get really bogged down in theory and trying to be like the you know highest level of preservation, but you also have to think about your users and you can build the most ideal workflow, but if your users aren't going to effectively um, you know execute it, then um, it, it's kind of a moot point. And also in that same vein, Keep the bar low um, because you never know what future you, the people in your role after you, are. You never know what their abilities are going to be. So if you keep something, um, you know, doable and manageable, then it's more sustainable for future you to ensure those processes will will keep going. Um, I'll, I'll sort of speed through these last few. Um, iterate through the process. Expect to find flaws. This workflow took about two years to really solidify. Um, be open to reworking the most established elements. Like I said, with the derivative TIFFs thing, I had to repackage about five terabytes of data, but that made things consistent and made things sustainable long-term, even though it was a lot of work. And also be open to feedback. Um, when new people join, they bring new ideas and be open to new ideas, even if you've established things. So that's the first workflow. Brilliant, thanks, Grayson. And, and thanks for um, managing to keep the time. Um, See, we've had a, a couple of questions, or at least one question in the chat already from Joachim, um, which I think possibly one of your colleagues ha has answered, um, which is just the, the Python scripts you've created. That, so they're not shared publicly. Do, would, would you be willing to share those? Because I can imagine they'd still be of interest, even if they weren't supported, because people might want to take them and adapt them. Yes, um, I believe, let me try to get, I believe um, they are on a publicly open uh, GitHub, my supervisor, I'm not sure what he said, I don't have the chat open, I'm assuming it was my supervisor who answered that question, because he did, he generated the, he created the scripts. Um, but yeah, if, if he's willing, I'm sure we're, we're able to share those. They are Luke, kind of... Luke said, he, he, I think they are available, but without support. So if Luke is your supervisor. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, he created those scripts. Oh, hello, kitty. Um, sorry, <laughs> I got distracted. Um, but yeah, I, those I mean, you can definitely, if you have some Python knowledge, take the different modules and sort of piece together what works to your workflow. Um, these are very built very much ingrained with that minimal metadata in mind, but um, yeah, we're more than willing to share them. I, I'm, I'm sure they'd be interested in that just because people are, like to see and like to take some ideas. Um, I had a question for you, what we see if anybody sure. else comes in, which is uh, how do you find the sort of balance of digitization staff versus people working on the kind of preservation workflows? Does that work out okay? Or do you find you get backlogs built up on one side or the other? Um, 
It tends to work well because the majority of stuff that the lab generates is pretty small. So the biggest sort of issue in that realm is um, we never want to, or I, I don't feel comfortable uploading from our um, network attached storage server while like uploading to AP Trust, for example, while someone in the lab might be uploading to the server because it's all the same production share. So um, just to keep from the wires getting crossed, we, I only try to upload when there are no students in the lab. And so we've added more and more students over, over the last few months. So it can kind of get tough with the timing. So we kind of, I, I work with the digital imaging manager a lot about the timing, We're like, okay, I need to upload things. Is there anyone gonna be in this morning? The biggest issue with that is um, the incanabula are pretty large. Our biggest mm. one has been about 800 gigs. They're typically over 200 gigs. So that upload takes a while. So that does take some planning as to, okay, are we going to have any students? Can we tell them not to upload to the, the production uh, server? And so that's that's the only issue that runs into it. Um, the, there isn't really a backlog in the traditional sense um, other than that. And it never lasts longer than a week or two. It, it really just depends. But it, it seems to be working pretty efficiently. Now, if we had like 20 students, then yeah. there would there would be an issue. And I'm sure we'd figure out a different workflow for that. <laughs> I can see that. Christopher's followed up in, in the chat. He's saying, uh, if it's 20 objects per batch, how many batches per week are processed on average? Do you have a sense of that? That really depends on, um, you know, if we have students in that week, like over the summer, we had students in, uh, two students working 20 hours a week. But during finals week, you know, some students might not come in. And it also mm -hmm. depends on, um, what we're working on that particular time. So an incunabula is imaged on the atom by our digital imaging manager, and that can take quite a while to, from start to finish. And so, you know, she might spend five hours getting that ready, and that's only one object in one, you know, batch. Um, but right now, the students are working on our, essentially, it's our, our school newspaper, and they're digitizing those from the 80s. So right. they're probably getting. You know, they're probably submitting like five to 10 batches, depending, and the okay. batches probably include, you know, 10 to 20 objects. And we also have new students, so they're learning the workflows, so their batches yeah. might only be a few objects. So it it really fluctuates. And we, I know this wasn't really the question, but we we struggle a lot with how to communicate to people who only see big number good, um, yeah. how to communicate that we're still, we're working consistently and we're still um, you know, even if we only got 10 objects in a week, that doesn't necessarily mean that we weren't, you know, doing, doing our job. I'm so trying you. to communicate the importance of, um, you know, the other aspects of our job as well in that, Sorry. like, it's not just output, it's caring for the materials, it's thinking about, you know, the best way to preserve them. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure we've all had these conversations yeah. with colleagues who don't quite understand. Uh, so... Okay, thanks, Grace.